Hey everybody, welcome to Listen Money Matters. When it comes to investing, the only people who get hurt on the roller coaster are the ones who jump off. My name is Matt and I'm here as always with Andrew. Andrew, how are you and what are you drinking? I'm good, but wait. What? Uh, uh, uh. All right, uh, now I just opened the beer, and now I'm really good. Now what are you? What are you? <laughs> what are you drinking? Uh, I am drinking another Belgian freeze. I, I partook in a six pack. Oh, you just all you got was the Belgian freeze. Yeah, wasn't got, like a mixed got, match. Nah, like not all my liquor stores let me do that. Uh, uh, but uh, Belgian freeze is damn tasty, so I have no issue. Yeah, River Horse. Mm. River Horse. How about you, man? I am drinking Flying Fish Red Fish. Which is a West Coast style hoppy red ale, brash, bold, bright, and in case we didn't mention, hoppy. <laughs> yes, and it is good. It's very good. I, I, you know, uh, you like the hoppy beers. I do. Come on. I think that yeah, yeah, I definitely do. And and you know what? Uh, we're both drinking beers brewed in our home state of New Jersey. There you go. How interesting. Uh, today's catchphrase is when it comes to investing, the only people who get hurt on the roller coaster are the ones who jump off, which I really like that catchphrase. I do. And it's appropriate. Mm. So that was sent in, uh, by Ryan via email. Thank you, Ryan, for the catchphrase. And you can send in your catchphrases to our Twitter account. It's at money matters, man. And you can send them in on our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash listen, money matters. And, you can also, I guess, since I mentioned that Ryan sent it in via email, you can send it to our email account, which is listenmoneymatters at gmail.com. So, uh, today, we are going to talk about economics, everyone's favorite topic, and we're going to talk about uh, opportunity cost, and what the fuck is opportunity cost? We have Dan Egan from Betterment.com on the show today. How are you, Dan? Very well. How are you guys doing? Very good. Very awesome. good. Are you drinking anything? Um, I wanted to, to get um, in line with you guys. So I'm actually, I, I have a beverage in each hand. Mm. And um, I actually have Double fisting. champagne. I wasn't going to say it. Uh, <laughs> champagne and beer. What? However. Not the champagne of beers. Um, actually, the champagne of tap water. So I am here in Manhattan. Um, and Manhattan is known for having some of the best tap water in the country. Uh, I regularly go upstate to where the reservoirs are, so I'm happily drinking some of the champagne of tap waters across the U.S. right now, as well as um, here at Betterment, we actually have a couple of developers who homebrew their own beer here. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so just trying to keep up with you guys, um, drinking something from the state that I live in, a little bit local. Uh, I'm having a red hibiscus ale that was brewed right here at Betterment. Wow. Wait, you yeah, actually I'm jealous, dude. Wait, you brewed it at Betterment? That's absolutely right. Um, we actually have a happy hour every Friday, and we keep a lot of the brown bottles, and we make our own Betterment beer. I think uh, it's on sort of a two-week rotation of different flavors. We decide a different flavor. Um, one of the, the programmers here named Harry Efron is a borderline professional beer brewer, uh, and so we just rotate through different kinds of beer uh, that we want to try and taste. Um, oh and so. Yeah, they don't actually list that as a perk on the uh, on the website, but I gotta say it's pretty sweet. They should absolutely list that as a <laughs> perk in your like jobs board, right? That that is all hibiscus, right? So it's the fl- you know the what's the Hawaiian yep. flower, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. On all, all the Hawaiian shirts, it's delicious. That's that's fucking amazing. That is. So do you guys drink like during the day? Just kind of <laughs> grab a brew and do some economic things and. I think we're not allowed to until after probably about five o'clock, but I'm, I'm, you know, definitely at about sort of four thirty, five o'clock on a Friday. Sure. You start seeing some uh, fortuitous little trips to the uh, the tap. Mm. <laughs> well, then that's we awesome. have to say cheers to that because that's 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 a pretty amazing. So uh, now that we all have our brews and we're uh, getting liquored up, let's talk about opportunity cost. I don't know what that is, so maybe you can just give me a brief overview of what what that entails and how that relates to economics. Absolutely. So um, these are probably one. Th- this is one of the driest, most boring things that in sort of econ one hundred and one they try and teach everybody. Um, that is a little bit one of those secret sauce things that it's it's really important that you learn through your life. Opportunity cost is simply what if you did something else. What if you didn't do this thing, whatever it happens to be? What if you did something else? Um, and when you hear it that way, it seems so like vague as to be completely useless. Like if I let's 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 play along with this. Let's say that I can either 
go out on a Saturday night with three of my buddies. I know I'm probably going to drop about $200 going out to a bar. Um, I know how much that costs. Yes. What is the opportunity cost of that $200 and that night out? Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, you yeah, mean, I mean like maybe you'll, you'll meet a nice lady and then you can get married in the future. So uh, like that, you mean? There's, well, exactly, right? So th- this is like the, the ridiculously frustrating thing with quote unquote opportunity costs. It seems like there's like an infinite number of them. And, you know, you could either go out with your buddies and save $100 and invest that $100 and end up with some amount of money in the future. You could not hang out with your buddies because, let's face it, you know a lot of their jokes already. You could try and find a lady. So you're missing out on meeting a nice lady. So, yeah, like this is the problem with opportunity costs is that um, if you just hear that sort of phrase, you're like, oh, well, the opportunity costs are infinite and I should never do anything because I could be doing something better in theory. So thank you, Econ 101, for not remotely making my life useful at so all. is it the, is it the cost of opportunity is that yeah i think so we're, we're kind of getting into uh you know more useful ways to think about it mm-hmm. it's the cost of like what if i did something else with this with this time with this money i think um you know the a big one there is that we don't usually think at all about it. you don't have to figure out what is for every given decision in every given moment of your life um, you know, what is the cost of not doing something different? You don't have to sit around and get paralyzed by it. You just need to sort of like put a little bit of thought into the alternatives, um, usually which are a little bit hidden for you, usually which you're not really thinking about. Um, that's where opportunity cost is really useful, is thinking about, okay, well, I can do the thing that I normally do. How much is that costing me in terms of something else that I could be doing? So. I generally, in my personal life, I actually managed to figure out how to make this useful for me. Hmm. Um, I think opportunity costs, how most people need to think about them, are basically about money, time, effort, and asking. Those four things. Money, time, effort, and asking. Um, always just, you know, anytime you're sort of doing something with one of those things, think about, like, what's the opportunity cost of this? And um, coming back to, you know, our thing, you know, what's, what's the opportunity cost of dating one girl? You know, being being committed. Monogamous, yes. Right? Yeah. Well, missing out on all the other girls that, you know, pass oh. by. <laughs> right. Which, I know that all, you know, the three of us definitely could simply have any of the other girls who are out sure. at any point in time. So that is a true opportunity. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's like the potential of some other things. So um, I think this, there, there's sort of two related ideas here. Um, there's opportunity cost, which is that you're definitely giving something else up, which is more along the lines of you've got girl A and girl B, you have to get locked down by one of them, but you know that those are your only two options. It's like, I can either go with A or B. Mm-hmm. There's another subtle part of this, which is getting even more into sort of financial theory, which is what's called optionality cost or option, option value. Um, and that's just the value of not getting locked down now and waiting a little bit longer to figure out if it should be girl A or girl B or girl C. Um, So I think that opportunity cost, you know, the simplest form is just a a matter of if you didn't, if you didn't do A, what could you do with B, um, with your time or with your money? Um, And I think that it usually, you know, it's it's better to go through sort of anecdotes and practice um, than trying to figure out, you know, what the, the core underlying principle of all this stuff is. Well, isn't that uh, – you see, I, I fear that you're going to get locked into the what-if scenario, right? Mm-hmm. So if you just keep doing that, aren't you – don't you fear of, like, never doing anything? Yeah, I, and I think there, there you get into the meta-opportunity cost. <laughs> oh, there's <laughs> if sit, more. If you sit around thinking about opportunity costs all the time, you're never going to flipping do anything. So, right. you know, like, think about it for a second – uh, and then, you know, go ahead and just get off, get off the fence. Well, how do you do that? How do you, how do you, uh, when do you know, when do you know it's time to stop asking questions and start doing it? Um, you know, I think it's practice. So okay. let's go the, through the four things, money, time, effort, and asking. Yeah. Um, all right. So money is actually kind of the simplest, right? It comes back to that 200 bucks, you know, is that why it it's first? Me? Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> what does it cost me to not, not spend 200 bucks right now? You know, what's the opportunity cost of that? And this isn't even just, you know, like, what is it, um, what else could I buy with this? I could buy a new pair of jeans or, you know, something like that. Um, Or a Russian mail order bride. Have you been looking at my web browser? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe I have. Um, 
you know, it literally costs you money, but it costs you future money. So one of the things that um, actually a good friend of mine, a guy named Michael Leersch, who was an academic and now works in the commercial application of behavioral finance, one of his key studies was looking at how, pe how much people thought saving money would be worth in the future. Um, and this is like the classic question that all of us need to understand about saving and investing. It's if I save $200 a month, um, once a month, and I do that every month, and it um, makes, say, 4% interest on an annual percentage rate basis, and I do that for the next 40 years, how much money do I end up with? This is like the, how much do I need to save for retirement? How much do I yeah. need to save for any given thing? Um, and the key thing there is that 4% interest per year thing. So humans are really pretty good at um, estimating things when they're linear, right? It's like uh, four is twice as much as two. Three is three times as much, uh, sorry, six is three times as much as two. Um, mm -hmm. When you start dealing with something that compounds, that has got like that exponential growth, like a, a zombie apocalypse kind of graph, um, we're really bad at estimating that. And yeah. we end up doing the linear thing where we say, okay, I'm going to take 200, uh, 200 bucks a month times 480 months, which is 40 years. And then I'm going to add on a bit because I know that the interest was doing something in there. If you sort of plot that line, you end up seeing that people systematically underestimate how much that account will be worth. They never overestimate how much that account's going to be worth. We always estimate things linearly, and when you have a compound growth situation, that means you systematically underestimate how much saving is going to be worth in the future. So one of the first things that I sort of taught myself about opportunity cost about, you know, if I'm going to go out every night and I'm kind of making this decision, you know, once a month um, for a, a big night out with friends of mine, um, I can look back and say, okay, if I make a habit out of that, then uh, in this case, I believe the answer is about $86,000. Mm -hmm. um, then I'm basically saying to future Dan, you know what? I'm sure you'd love to have nearly 100K, but um, I really think it's better for me to go out with my buddies once a month. Now, that's fine. Like, I think it's actually worth money or it's worth paying it to experience your life now when it's important. Sure. But it's always good to be able to say, okay, I'm spending money now. If I invested it, it would grow at a compound growth place, and I'm probably going to underestimate the value of that in the future. So I should weigh that a little bit more heavily if I think about maybe it's not worth buying the $10 beer instead of the $6 beer. Yeah, you know what? You, you had mentioned, and this really kind of blew my mind, and I, my brain kind of went down that path. Uh, when you said compounding and how we always uh, underestimate you know, how much it's going to be worth in the future. And then you brought up the zombie apocalypse, <laughs> right? That, because I, I'm a Walking Dead fan. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking to myself, oh, right. So there's more zombies. They eat people. They create more zombies. I kind of want you to, to explain this. Uh, I, I want you to relate compound interest in, in the zombie apocalypse now. Okay. Um, that's actually surprisingly easy. Um, yes, that's why I want you to is, explain it. Yeah, there is a famous brain teaser that's really effective at sort of differentiating between people. Um, in a lake, there's a, a lake, a giant lake, and on the first day, um, a lily pad appears, and the lily pad doubles in population every day. Right, so it starts out at one, um, and then it has two, and then it has four, and so on and so forth. And in 48 days, those lily pads have grown and completely covered the lake. So here's the question for you. How many days did it take before the lily pads covered half of the lake? Well, I guess it would depend on how big the lake is, right? Nope. Oh, wait, how many days did it take to cover the entire lake? No, how many days did it take to, until the lily pads covered no. half the lake? No, no, I got, I got your question, but how many days uh, did it take to cover the entire lake? Uh, let's say 48. So I'm going to say it took 47 days to cover half the lake. Boom. Exactly. Wait, how did you know that? <laughs> well, because it doubles, it, do it doubles every day. So the day before it's covered, it's, it's half full. Yep. So if you look back to like the zombie apocalypse, right? Uh, Does that mean I get a job at Betterment now? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> this is a question that um, it's part of a suite of sort of like cognitive tests that are uh -huh. called the cognitive reflection test because they're really good at sort of 
um, determining whether or not somebody takes a second to think about these things that are a little bit counterintuitive. Usually if you say, how long does it take this to cover half the lake? People go, oh, well, if it took 48 days, then it probably took about 24 days to sure. cover half the lake, right? Um, but the answer is 47. It basically ended up um, that last day, every lily pad produced another lily pad. So every zombie produced another zombie or, or converted a human being, a normal human being to a zombie. Sure. So literally that last day, you went from 50% zombie and 50% human to 100% zombie. That's how quick it sneaks up on you. That's how powerful compound growth is. And that's what you would get with uh, saving $200 into in some sort of investment account. Yep, if you're if you're getting a and this is key, if you're getting a risk free four percent and it's just definitely compounding, um, you know, every month, every year, that is the kind of growth that you are getting. You are getting, let's call it zombie growth. Yeah, let's call it that. Yep. And, so yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead again. Yeah, it just I think that's sort of one of the most. Um, it's kind of one of the most insightful things about how we discount our future, how impatient we are. Is that like there are these things that. Um, we know that people say like it's about investing for the long term and the earlier you start saving the more powerful it is um, but we don't realize that it's zombie powerful and it really is it's you know every day um, dollars are making more dollars for you if you save and invest it at a rate which can become mind-boggling if you actually don't look at the account so I, I want to take that and I want to I want to push it a little further and I want to, I want to see what you think. Um, how do, would we apply something like opportunity cost to choosing our investments? And and maybe one angle could be you know distribution, you know similar to like how Betterment does. Or another would be you know I could put all my money into a four hundred one k and <clears throat> I'll save on taxes and whatever. But then when I need to buy a house, I I won't be able to access that money. Versus maybe not using a four hundred one k. Like how can you? Mm -hmm. Use opportunity cost to and apply it to your personal investing decisions. Uh, great point. So I think that we had a couple of different actual things in there. One of them was opportunity cost, and the other one was optionality cost, basically like the cost or the value of freedom. So opportunity cost, I think, is most clearly showed by um, what if you invested in an investment that just made you net of fees or expenses or taxes 1% more a year, right? Um, that's an opportunity cost that you go into this thing or that thing. Um, literally, it's just a little 1% a year difference. Um, that's worth an incredible amount of money over 40 years. Um, mm -hmm. But when we're making investment decisions, and this comes back to the original thing about all, you know, the alternatives that we have out there, it can be really frustrating because it's like, well, there's an almost infinite number of investment alternatives. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's the case. There's you know, you can buy incredibly complicated, you can buy single stocks, you can buy single bonds, you can buy ETFs, you can buy mutual funds, you can buy these things that are, you know, short leveraged mutual funds nowadays. Um, one of the things that just is always true is that however much these ETF costs, if you can get the same exposure, like S&P 500 exposure, for um, half a percent less, you have just made yourself a lot of money in the long run. So, the one thing that's always certain is that lower costs mean you are making more money in the long run. Um, it's usually pretty good to say, um, unless I understand how spending a bit more is going to definitely make me more money, it's worth just reducing your costs as low as possible. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> All right. So uh, I want to talk, I want to go back onto the money time effort asking thing. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, I want to go to time. What? How do you? How do you relate it to time? Time is just what else could I do with this time if I wasn't spending doing it, whatever I'm doing now. Um, this for me is laundry. Um, okay. I, I I do not think I am especially talented at doing the laundry. Is there a um, talent? There's our talent involved in laundry. I just throw I this shit in the thing. I definitely know that I've been told I've done it wrong in the past. Okay. Um, You're so married, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it, it happened long before that. I'm sure that family members or friends have told me that as well. Um, when sweaters come back a few sizes smaller than they went in, mm. I'm pretty sure I did something wrong. Um, but like cold no water, way. let it hang out to dry. Okay, do you want to do my laundry? <laughs> <laughs> so 
like it's one of these things that I know um, there's not just sort of an opportunity cost to me doing laundry. I have to learn how to do laundry correctly. I have to spend time looking at, I don't know, lights and darks or something. Um, there's actually a surprising amount of opportunity cost to learning how to do the laundry correctly. Um, I'd rather basically get my time back, both in the learning curve time, but also in the time that I have to, have to spend every week sorting stuff by basically paying somebody else to do this for me. Um, this is possible in Manhattan and New York City. You basically call up a, a laundry service, they just come um, and they pick up your laundry, they take it away, um, and then they come back the next day. That's a thing? It's, it yeah, like, dude, it's awesome. It is, it is like, it was one of these revelations almost where I said, I can do this, I am immediately doing this, and I am getting back, you know, what's usually about an hour of my day. And you could pay them in like an extra 25 cents per thing and they'll like fold it for you or something. Like, it's, it's pretty... And so I think that's wow. one of the other key points about this is that um, what people usually think of a lot of the time is the cost to them. So I will admit um, paying to have somebody do my laundry for me, I think it usually costs about 25 bucks for what is just essentially a big sack of laundry. Um, however, I did look and see and say that, well, actually, it cost me $18 to do this laundry myself anyway. Right, so mm. I'm really just looking at about a seven dollar difference between me doing the laundry um, and somebody else doing the laundry for me. It's not that I just pay twenty five bucks and that's a horrible thing. I got to pay something anyway. So I don't pay for laundry detergent, I don't pay for washing machines, and I don't pay with my time. Um, and that really, in terms of just money, only cost me seven bucks. It's an amazing deal. And how do you? But um, how did you determine that it cost you eighteen or what did you say eighteen dollars to, mm -hmm. to do your laundry? How did you determine that? Because that's where uh, I, I find the most. That's where I find the difficulty is in examining how much things cost because you uh, – obviously, did you take into account like how much it costs for that amount of water to use? Uh, I don't even pay for water. I just looked at you know washing machine. I think one sack is about three loads of laundry. So you get basically the wash um, costs somewhere around two bucks. The dryer is not that efficient, so you have to do it twice. So if you're looking at two bucks plus three bucks per um, – Per right. load, and yeah. I'm getting three loads. That's fifteen bucks, and then you add on a little bit of money for the detergent. Interesting. See, that's where I would, I would, I would underestimate that immensely. Uh, so, I, I actually, I want to focus on like the the decision aspect at the end. So, I think yeah. it's like easy to say, you know, if it costs eighteen dollars to do it, and you pay twenty five dollars for someone else to do it, you'd be like, well, that that makes sense because take a few hours. Like that, that's an easy decision. Mm -hmm. But I think when things get more complicated, the numbers get bigger, and it's maybe over longer periods of time. It's not necessarily clear, how, like if it is better. And maybe the the question is, how do you determine that it is better, say, to have someone else do your laundry or you do it? Like, yeah, what, even though the, it costs more, right? Uh, I'm going to come back to sweaters that are the right size. Okay. Um, but I also have the same thing with with sort of like I I always think the. The, the relative value of DIY versus um, having somebody else do it, number one is always a personal preference. Um, you know, I, I know people who love figuring out how to fix their cars themselves. Um, right. And, you know, it's a little bit like it's not a cost to them. They're actually going to enjoy learning how to do this thing themselves and, and playing with it. So it's an unfair market. Um, this was one of the things that uh, way back in my, my game theory class, um, they were talking about how you should never compete against somebody who enjoys doing that thing more than you because they're just going to like spend more free time doing it. They're going to enjoy it. They're going to like stay up late on a Saturday night to read about how to do it better. Um, you know, so if you are, if you have something where you really enjoy doing it, it's going to be usually pretty hard for any professional to compete against you, um, in terms of a, a value to you basis, because it's basically like free money to you when yeah. you do it yourself. Um, that said, there, there are definitely things that I think if you're just looking at cost, um, it's very hard to justify the amount of like sort of skill gathering that it takes a given individual to get to a place where they're good at it. Um, and the, the, these aren't like huge tasks. It's just lots and lots of little tasks. I pay for somebody to cut my hair. Could I figure out how to cut my hair myself? Yeah, of course. And like I, love I that. definitely save like 15 bucks a month or something, you know? But um, – like it's, I'm going to go through a bad learning curve where my hair is going to look funny <laughs> and I'm yeah. probably going to end up yeah. <laughs> going back to the barber shop with like a funny haircut and then they're going to make fun of me. Fix uh, it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, 
So it's not that you you know like you couldn't, and if you were really sort of penny pinching and everything, you, you you can definitely do this. And maybe there are people who enjoy cutting their own hair. I'm not one of them. Um, it's it really is a personal purpose thing. So it's like um, okay. If I don't enjoy cutting my hair, it's going to take me a while to figure out how to cut my hair. I can just pay some dude 15 bucks for it. He's going to be fast. He's going to be efficient. I give him 15 bucks, and then I come back to my real job, which hopefully, arguably, I am way better at than he is. You know, he's good at cutting hair. I'm good at compute, um, programming very sophisticated computer algorithms. Um, I'll help him out with his investing, and he can help me out with my hair. That's the way the economy is supposed to work. Interesting, because I, I, you know what? That's funny. I, not to make this a plug for Betterment or anything, but that's how I view Betterment is I, yep. I, I don't, uh, I'm not into investing as much as Andrew is. I, it's not something that I'm passionate about. It's not something, something that I want to learn or, or know more about or, you know, start day trading or whatever, whatever, like, you know, learning about stocks and how the market works. I'd rather pay whatever it would cost to give my money to somebody else and make it work for me and make it as easy as possible. And I think that's what, that's the, really the beauty of the software and, and why I'm such a fan of it, because that's how I think in that way. Andrew, what do you think? You so I, I do enjoy picking this, the you know, different stocks and whatever, and, I, and a small amount of my money I do do that with. For me, uh, I think that I do not know best. And when it comes – I worked for an investment bank and I saw – you know, I, I did like data for them and stuff. So I saw all the tools and the research they have and they're highly sophisticated. And I guess I personally feel that I shouldn't even attempt to compete with that. So my – this is a plug. This is just coming into our conversation about mm -hmm. opportunity costs. Yeah. So I actually – so I, I used to work in London and then um, my company moved me back over to New York. Um, and they have something that's kind of like an IRA over in the UK. But if you're an American citizen and you move back to the United States, the IRS no longer respects the fact that you have like a, a tax sheltered account somewhere else. So you become a very nasty like offshore hedge fund if you try and do that. Right. So I, I had to bring my IRAs um, back on shore. And like I'm one of these people who knows how to program computers and pull prices from the internet. and build a little algorithm that, you know, builds a portfolio for me and rebalances and does all this stuff. And I think it was after about like the, the third weekend of me trying to actually do this stuff in like a scalable manner myself, um, I found out about Betterment and I was like, wait, so somebody actually built like to a professional level with, you know, like um, guardrails around it and everything, exactly what I'm trying to replicate here myself. Of course, I'm just going to pay you ten bucks to do this for me. Right. Uh, you know, like this is like hours of my my Saturday morning. So I think it's an interesting. Thing. I do this for a living. I think I probably am like in a microcosm one of the people who can do it pretty well. Even me, I sort of look at the efficiency of writing writing this up and, and delivering it to lots of people and say. I cannot compete with that, even as a person who contributes to the code base here. Mm -hmm. um, that's just like it's so much safer and more consistent. Um, you know, I, I'd much rather do that than try and figure out how to do it myself on my Saturday mornings. Yeah, and I think Andrew, you're a little bit more hip to that than I am for sure, because I will try to do everything myself and end up just spending way more time doing it myself than I would I'm, if I I'm constantly somebody. begging you to to yeah. take things off of your plate. Yeah. yeah. And I had a I had a boss that you know it, I think the it comes down to uh when I was younger I had a boss who thought the same way I did and he was older and you know he had a successful company in, in in a sense. And so I so when I found out that he was the same way I'm like, "Oh, so what I'm doing is correct." Like this dude had a uh, 50,000 square foot warehouse and the heater broke and so this guy is up in the rafters covered head to toe in oil like fixing this heater himself but spent he spent two weeks up in his heater trying to fix his heater when he could have been doing so many more things for his business but that's where he chose to spend his time and to me i'm like dude that guy's hands on like that's right. the, that's the way to do it and then it wasn't until much later where i thought that guy's a fucking idiot. Like he just spent <laughs> all that time d messing around with a stupid heater. He could have paid some guy a couple of thousand bucks, got it done, and then two weeks of his time he could have been spending, I don't know, buying more product or selling more product or whatever to increase his business. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And that's crazy. So moving on to the effort part, 
That's, what is, that's, 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 that's amazing. That was exactly the next segue, right? Yeah. Is, um, and this comes back to like the idea that you really should specialize at the stuff that you're, you enjoy more or you're better at than other people. Um, so there are lots of things that like, let's be honest, you know, like you can think that you're a Superman who's got unlimited time and patience and ability to, to do these things. But the fact is people burn out. You actually only have so many hours of good focused time every day to do something. And Every hour that you're putting effort into something that you're kind of like not the best at, mm-hmm. or that you're not going to get like advantageously compensated yeah. for, yeah. Um, is kind of money lost. It's kind of like an opportunity cost of you know your four hours a day of good concentration time. Um, so the more that you can offload that, and this is you know this is what a lot of computer programs are. Any one of us can do math. Um, but having something that does it consistently and well and where you just, you know, I know what sort of like, I could figure out what 12 times 13 is, but why would I ever spend my mental effort on doing that when I can offload it onto something that's just like virtually costless? Like a calculator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's also one of the things it's, it's a thin difference between time and effort. Um, but I do think that, you know, if you feel yourself getting burned out, um, by some task, even if it's learning something, um, that can be an indication that you're kind of experiencing an opportunity cost where you could be spending, you know, you could be going for a run with your wife and dog along the river right now. You could be spending your life doing things that are like actually going to make you happy rather than burning yourself out to, to save a few bucks. Yeah. But I guess that's really the balance. It, it, yep. it, that, uh, see, I, mm, Ugh, I struggle with the happiness doing things balance. Well, I, I think that's an awesome like piece right there, like a question because how do you attach a cost to happiness? You know, not not yeah to <laughs> say not going on the run with your wife and you know and the dog. Like, how do you uh, reconcile that? Because in or does that, that case, o- you yeah, may that- always choose to work because monetarily that makes the most sense. Or or the other way around. You might think like, hey, I enjoy running with my wife and dog and that's in the park and I'd rather do that for the rest of my life. Therefore, I'm never going to make any money. What's money? Fuck money. What are we doing here? <laughs> Why is life? You know, just go down that path. The, the, there's uh, unfortunately econ 101 isn't going to really be able to answer that question for you <laughs> uh, i do think there is one element of like I, I get stuck into this problem and i'm pretty sure you guys too of like thinking oh well if i just fix this if i figure this out once then i'll have like limitless future cases of benefiting from having done it right right, right. It's like if i that's a programmer's and, dilemma and this is true right it's like okay if i i bike around the city so i've learned how to fix um popped uh, tubes and flat tires and stuff because yeah. that's really important. Like once I learned how to do that, I'm not paying some guy 30 bucks and I don't have to like wait and take the bike to him. I can fix it right at that spot myself. So sure. there's a little bit of, you know, you do have to think about how realistic is it that if I learn how to do this thing or if I do it myself, that there's going to be a real advantage to me every single time in the future. I tend to be a little bit too optimistic about my own ability to do that. It's like, oh, if I just like, um, you know, learn how to how to do this one thing. Then every possible time in the future that it happens, I'm, it's going to be the exact same situation, and I'm going to blow through it without any problems whatsoever. Um, it's just not true. Um, yeah, so it's you know, unless you know that what you're doing, you're, it's going to take you that amount of time rather than three times the amount of time that you're budgeting for, which is the other thing that always happens to me. Uh, and that you know you're going to use it every time. It's a little bit like. You know, let the guy who who did spend the time figuring out how to change the the wheel on a a, a bike really fast. Let him get his dues. Um, you can make your money from him somewhere else. Yeah, I, that's the hard part to determine though, because uh, you know, like you said the, the bike example. You ride your bike all the time. That's how you that's how you transport. That's how you mm-hmm. get around. I get around with a car. So why wouldn't I want to know how to change my own tire in my car? I think you would. It's for the same reason as the bike, which is that um, you're going to experience a lot of time waiting for somebody else. In this case, it's almost not money. It's time. You're going to have to mm. wait for somebody else to change the wheel for you. Whereas if you change the wheel, you can bring it to the garage. They can fix it. You're, you know, it's, it's an all around better thing. On the other hand, figuring out how to change, I don't know, your fuel injectors. Um, well, it's not something you would do all the time. No, no. Um, and not that you would, you would change a tire all the time. And, and, and by the way, for uh, everyone listening, I know how to change a tire on a car, so I don't want any emails. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to do that. I had to do it twice. But I learned, I mean, it's kind of, you once you learn it, I mean, I, that's the thing. Uh, as a programmer as well, 
you you like to build those things, take the time to learn that one thing to build it so that for the rest of your life, uh, it it will just be that thing. It'll just it'll do the work that it needs to do. But then sometimes it always doesn't it doesn't work out that way. You didn't realize that there was something else out there that was already built or had already existed that you didn't need to know how to do that yourself. I have I don't think that I've ever correctly estimated how long it's going to take me to build a thing. And thereafter, how little time it's going to take to maintain it, <laughs> right, ever. Right, like if right. you can find a, a developer who correctly estimates that, especially for the stuff that's like their, their pet projects, uh-huh. I would be amazed. We, ne- we never estimate that the correct way. No. But I, I think about it like, and, you, and we're talking about programming, but you can, you can do that with anything. Like I could set up my TV, right? This is like, I can set up all of my equipment so that it it's works the one time and I never have to mess with it again. But then... I don't know, a couple of weeks or months down the road, something happens and you don't know what, and then all of a sudden you forget everything and it's like, well, do I just hire a guy to come out here and fix this or do I, you know, since I spent all this time learning it, do I do it myself? Mm-hmm. It's just, I don't know, it gets it gets out of hand. But um, the, the one part of this that I'm, you know, I got the mind, the money, time, effort part. Mm-hmm. The asking part is where I was, re- I really don't understand how that, <laughs> how that yep. fits in. Um, this is one that I think um, I wish I had learned so much earlier in my life. I think the people who already get this, um, you know, have, have probably like far exceeded me in a, a number of dimensions. And I hope um, that what you're about to say doesn't do this to me because I feel like it is. I feel so, like you're going to enlighten me in some way here. Um, there's usually zero opportunity cost to asking somebody something. Um, if it's the pretty girl at a bar and like, say you like, Damn you, it. Know, you, em- you get embarrassed yourself. It's really not a cost. Like asking somebody, you know, if they'd like to go on a date, asking somebody to refer you to a job or connect you with somebody, um, asking somebody because you're in a tight spot to do you a favor. Um, the act of asking has usually zero opportunity cost whatsoever. Uh, and I think that there's sort of a, a natural built in, idea that there's a much higher opportunity or a much higher cost to asking about things. We, we sort of perceive, this is, this is one of the few areas where it's, it's like a reverse thing. We perceive a very high cost to asking about somebody as if not asking them is some asset we have to preserve. We have to preserve our, our pride or their perception that we're somebody who never asks for anything. Um, this is the one case where I think it's like there's far higher, we perceive this weird high opportunity cost when actually it's nearly zero. And um, I've always been amazed at how far ahead um, I can come out just by saying, you know, either I don't understand that. Can you please explain it to me? Or, hey, could you do me a favor? Or, could you introduce me to that person? Um, this is the one where, like, the opportunity cost to asking is usually pretty much zero. And it's something that you should do all the time. That is, the, the, well, first of all, the girl part, I mean, the girl analogy is huge. Especially if, like, from my entire dating experience uh, as a young as a young man, uh, yes, you're right. It, there is absolutely no cost to asking, but I always I always had that fear that by asking, I'm I'm. It's like it's like points when you play video games. Like every time you do that action, it's you're losing something. And right. why, but why is that? Again, I think it's like we, we perceive ourselves as having this asset, which is like our pride or, yeah. or something. And like the weird thing is, is that it's this like really quickly depreciating asset. It's right? not tangible. Yeah. It's you just know, like thing. say you ask a girl and she laughs and says, I would never date a guy with a beard. Um, you know, you'll be like, OK, that's a little <laughs> bit mean. Um, but guarantee you, if that happens on Friday night by Saturday night, like your asset's going to be back up to 100% in terms of pride. Interesting. So, and I relate that to asking for a raise. Absolutely. Exactly. That's one of the things that I think, um, you know, most people, and it comes back to the general idea of opportunity cost. If you're staying where your job is, you're staying with the devil that you know, um, it, you don't know your market. Um, costs. You don't know what you could be getting somewhere else. One of my, my econ professors, I uh, was talking to him sometime, and I saw that he had an offer letter from a different university on his desk. And I had been looking at do, you know, potentially doing a lot of work with him. So I was like, wait, are you leaving? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I just wanted to know my market value. Like he literally was just kind of like saying, if I went and got a job somewhere else, what would they pay me? 
And he said, all I'm doing is finding my market value, and then I want to stay here. So I'm going to use it to negotiate a better, a better wage here. And I think, again, that's, that's exactly the point. Um, know what You should know what the opportunity cost is. You know, maybe I could get paid more if I went somewhere that was um, a, a bigger corporation or more bureaucratic, etc. cetera. But um, I need to know that to know what the margin is to make it worth staying here where I really enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, see, I, I, you know, so, uh, I want to, so that, that, that has money in it. I mean, and all this, all this kind of ties into money, right? But you, and you mentioned, uh, or what, what was the thing you mentioned earlier? Uh, option value? Optionality value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. So, so I want to dive a little bit more into that. Great. So, um, op- th- this is just sort of like that idea of, um, keeping your options open as opposed to locking them down. Um, and one of the things I, I sort of have learned throughout life is that we tend to commit to things or um, give up our option value way too early. Like option value, the, the freedom to do A or B um, is a valuable thing and we want to preserve it until the last moment where we're really giving something up um, by not committing to it. Um, and so I think that optionality, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example. Example that doesn't involve dating a girl, to be honest. <laughs> we do that a lot. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but like you know, if it's um, sort of like you know that you can always reserve a hotel and you're waiting. So let's say that you, you're looking at either um, a really nice Airbnb place or a somewhat less nice Airbnb place, mm-hmm. um, and there are two very different situations here. You have um, in the case that you you kind of always have um, the, 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 rub, the less attractive one um, has plenty of space. Um, you know it's never going to fill up. Um, so you've got a, a high degree of freedom over there. You have a nicer place that um, is a little bit expensive and you're not really sure that you want to pay that much. You have a high degree of optionality you can reserve by saying, I'm not going to go for one or the other. Let me see how much the plane tickets are. Let me see how much I plan on spending on the rest of the, the trip. Um, we, like, my little brother did this the other day where he sort of said, um, I have, have, I'm going to be taking a, a trip soon. Um, I don't want to buy the plane tickets now um, because they might go down. Right. Like, yeah, but, you know, they, they might go up. Is there <laughs> actually any option value in this? Like, is there, is there a benefit, if you don't know what the price is going to do, to maintaining out of it? Um, and he said, well... You know, if you put it that way, you're like, no, there, uh, yeah, if, 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 if all it is is that the price might move in either direction, there's no option value. So I was like, okay, so lock that down and move on to the other things that do have option value. If you had something where um, you expected the price to drop and there's a good reason for that or where you're actually maintaining, like, the ability to get a better option by, um, by not committing to anything um, – I'm not doing a great job of explaining it, but it's uh, it's something that I'm still working on figuring out myself. But that's if you know, or you have a really good inclination, because yep. the the plane thing is is the a great example because you don't know, you don't know if that mm-hmm. plane's gonna drop. It could go up, and 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 all you did was waste time by not booking it right then and there. Yep. Right. Well, actually, I would put it the other way. Okay. Um, I would say that optionality um, is why procrastination works. <laughs> so um, if you basically have an assignment that's due for work sure. um, on Friday and you know that it's going to take you about half an hour to complete, um, by not completing it before like an hour before it's really due, you might have avoided the need to do it altogether. If they came back and said, actually, we've changed this entire project and now we're going to be doing it differently and you don't need to work on that thing. Um, so time has a big optionality thing to it, right? It's like we're often approaching a deadline of some sort where we're going to have to make a decision. It's just the idea of there's a lot of value in not making the decision before you absolutely have to. There's a lot of value in not doing the work before you really have to. There is value, but I mean, don't you think that doing like, all right, in that example, don't you think that doing the work, even if it didn't, even if it ended up playing out that you didn't have to do it in the first place, like if you would have weighed it, uh, don't you still learn something from that? And isn't there still value there? I don't know. My, my parents would probably say yes, that it builds character. <laughs> yeah, right. You should do that and you, you should have your homework assignments right. in, you know, ahead of time. Um, 
I think that, you know, it, it, it sounds really bad, but actually it's a very good thing to always be delivering the project that's due next. Sure. Um, it means that you haven't wasted any time on projects that don't actually need to be delivered. Right. And then how does this, I mean, going back to how this all relates to money, uh, mm -hmm. because, I, I mean, it was the first thing that we mentioned, and the idea of, of and the procrastination is a huge one, especially mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the investing world, right? So you have a lot of people who just are out there who uh, I'll invest when the when the market's right or it's not not a good time in the market or they don't they don't really know. Yep, or, no no no. But that's that's really like how do you I mean I guess knowing the uh the uh opportunity cost in waiting or the, or I don't know or, or in the or the option value of waiting uh is a bad thing. Exactly. I think I think that's where most people um you know they don't see where there is and isn't opportunity cost. So um IRAs are a great example. Uh, we re recently um, updated a piece of analysis that I did looking at basically what's the difference between funding your IRA as soon as possible versus as late as possible. So everybody can say you, you're thinking about funding your 2014 IRA. Um, in theory, you could have done that on January 1st, 2014. That's yes. when the tax year started. Um, the government is kind, so they'll actually let you um, fund and sort out your IRA on April 15th, 2015, 15 months later, right? Hmm. Very big time period. Um, now, is there an option value in not putting your money in, into an IRA? Um, the way the IRS work, rules work, if you, you know, shouldn't have contributed that much to your IRA, you can always undo it. Um, you, you know, just have to Port the capital gains outward. Sure. It's not like the end of the world. So the cost of staying out of the IRA is about 15 months worth of return on average. It's what you should expect it to cost you to, to wait until the last minute to fund your IRA. So there's a, a definite sort of um, opportunity cost to not funding your IRA immediately. And it's about 15 months worth of work. On the opposite side of it is optionality. So um, once money goes into an IRA, unless I have a really good reason for taking it back out, I'm going to pay a penalty rate on it. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be pretty significant in terms of if I'm taking $100 out of an IRA, I can very well end up with only 65 um, given the penalty tax rates that are, that are assessed on it. So yeah. the, the value of money um, that is in a non-optioned, you know, an IRA if it, account is much lower than that which is in sort of an account where I've already paid taxes on it and I can just take it out um, freely. And that's why you know, we, we give advice here about sort of how people should set up a safety net goal. And one of the pieces of advice is a safety net goal should be a taxable or an individual investment account that is not one of your IRAs. So that if you need it, you can just kind of take money out, spend it, and no, no harm, no foul. If you use your IRAs, once you've taken that money out, uh, number one, especially if you're too young, you'll pay a penalty rate of interest on it. So $100 coming out of it is not worth $100. But number two, um, you can't put that money back in. Like Once it's come out, you've lost that tax deferred benefit on that amount of money for the rest of your life until you would have retired and taken it out. Right. So, um, you know, individual investment account, taxable account money has more optionality on it than money that's stuck in an IRA. And you, you want to buy just enough op um, optionality, things that, you know, your safety net, your emergency fund, a house down payment, you know that you're going to be spending money on these things long before you retire. Mm -hmm. So you want to maintain just enough optionality um, to, you know, to, to sort of smooth yourself and buffer yourself through. Um, and the rest can go into the retirement. I'm in savings account where it actually grows faster. And that's diversification. Um, they're both diversified. I don't think, um, you know, right. what it is at a really technical level is tax rate diversification. Right, okay. Um, you know, where you're thinking about, well, what's my tax rate now? What's my tax rate going to be when I retire? Am I going to be in a higher income tax bracket or a lower income tax bracket? It's a, that's a slightly more complicated financial planning thing. Sure. Now. So uh, do we think that in this conversation we've covered what opportunity cost means? I definitely think so. I don't, I I don't know that so. I have anything more interesting to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the, and the beer, hibiscus beer has kicked in. Yep. And all right. <laughs> Get, getting a little bit sleepy. Listen, it's horrible. This, whoever is talking is just so boring. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you know what, though? I, I, I do know that one beer – 
can get you sleepy. Two beers will get you sleepy. But after three, you're right back in it. Sure. Mm. So you need to keep going after this call. <laughs> for sure. So, uh, well, Dan, thank you so much for coming on and enlightening us in this, in this topic. It's been my pleasure. I think it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. And uh, I want to and, – and, and you work for Betterment.com. And, uh, and, of course, we love Betterment. So a uh, big shout-out to you guys. So thank you so much for what you do over there. My pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure, guys. And listen, uh, since asking has uh, very little – uh, what, what do we call it? Be- asking has very little uh, opportunity costs. I'm already married, just in case you're. Yeah, no, but, it, but, it, <laughs> but asking, I mean, asking is is practically costs you nothing, and that's why we yep. want you guys to go and uh, email us at listenmoneymatters at gmail dot com and ask us anything you'd like because it costs you nothing, and we will uh, sometimes answer on the show or we'll just answer you back. Andrew uh, controls all that stuff, so he loves it, doesn't doesn't you? you da- doesn't, doesn't I? Doesn't I, you? I, I promise to respond within. One hour to three days, but possibly 14 days or 20 days. All right, wonderful. Really You've given yourself a good buffer there. That's perfect. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, go to listenmoneymatters at gmail.com, email us, and let us know what you think of the show. And also, if you really like the show, we want you guys to subscribe to the podcast on whatever app you're using. Just hit the subscribe button because we do an episode every single day, and it will be automatically downloaded to your app uh, 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time every morning. 6 a.m. Uh, and if you really, really like the show, you can leave us a review on Stitcher or iTunes. I'm going to read a the, probably the shortest review we've ever gotten. And I actually know this person, but it's by Mike Grossman or Mike F. Grossman from Canada. Yes. <laughs> from across the pond. <laughs> I, I know that's not across the pond, but... Uh, the title is Julie and I love Matt and Andy five stars. I wish I could request more cats for this podcast. Right. Meow. <laughs> that, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. there, the joke behind that is that somebody, uh, left us a review on iTunes and said that our podcast needs more cats. So, uh, we will try to get more cats on the show, but it will not be coming from me. Maybe Andrew will get another cat and we can have them on the show. Uh, if you guys uh, go onto our website, it's listenmoneymatters.com, and you can check out our toolbox with all the tools that we mentioned here on the show, including Betterment, and you can find that at listenmoneymatters.com slash toolbox. And I want to mention real quick the charity event that we're a part of. It's the Texas 4000, in which case uh, – uh, Joe from Stacking Benjamins, his son is going to be joining about 90 other people on a bike trek from Austin, Texas, all the way up to Alang- uh, Anchorage, Alaska. And it's going to take about 72 days, and they're doing it for cancer research. And we are in a competition with Stacking Benjamins to raise more money than them, right? So all you got to do is go to listenmoneymatters.com slash Texas 4000. It's Texas 4000. And you're going to enter who's riding or who you're riding for and it is going to be list of money matters you don't have to ride you just have to say you know who the person's riding for type in list of money matters type in your donation and let's beat the stacking benjamins podcast let's raise more money than them i think it caps out about a twenty five hundred dollars but we can do more but we can do a lot better than that i think what do you think andrew I think so. Yeah, I think we could do it. Uh, I also want to give a big thanks to Betterment for being our very first sponsor. So thank you. And uh, Dan, make sure you thank everybody there at the at the office and uh, uh, let them know that we really appreciate it. Everybody gets a hug. Excellent. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Dan, thanks again so much for being on the show. My pleasure. And thanks for hanging out with us. And, of course, we look forward to the next episode. So later. Later, man. Tell your friends about this show.